And hello, friends. We welcome you to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Television. Chapters is the show that profiles authors, editors, and publishers in West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. I'm Elliot Parker, and it's great to have you with us. We are delighted to have Marshall University history professor and author uh, Kat Williams with us here today to talk to us about her new book, The All-American Girls After the AAGPBL, which we'll define what that means here in just a moment, <laughs> How Playing Pro Ball Shaped Their Lives. And Kat Williams joins us today. She earned her PhD from the University of Kentucky. She's a professor of American history at Marshall University. Her areas of specialization include U.S. women's history and the history of sport. She's the author of several articles, including Women's Baseball and Beyond, Life After the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League. Her book, The All-American Girls After the AAG PBL, How Playing Pro Ball Shaped Their Lives, is the book we're talking about today and has been recently published. And she's also the president of the International Women's Baseball Center. And we're delighted to have Kat Williams with us today to talk to us about her outstanding book. So, Kat, welcome Thank to you. the show. Good to have you Thank here. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's nice being here. I wanted to ask you... Uh, you know, a lot of us have a little bit of familiarity or a little reference with this because uh, the Tom Hanks and Gina Davis yeah, movie, A League right. of Their Own, came out right. uh, in 1992, which was a wonderful movie. I, I wanted to ask you, how, how close, for people who've seen that movie, how mm -hmm. close is that to the, the real-life experiences of what these girls went through and these women mm -hmm. went through that you wrote about in your book? Well, if you talk to the former players, which uh, uh, the, uh, who will very quickly tell you that it's about 90% accurate. They feel really comfortable with it. There are a couple of issues they have. First of all, um, uh, to a person, they, were, they will tell you there would never be a man in the locker room. So the, the Tom Hanks in the locker room, that would never happen. The other thing is the, um, the sort of love story, not that that didn't happen, but that piece between uh, uh, Tom Hanks' character and Gina Davis, that, that kind of stuff bothered them a little bit. But almost to a person, they will tell you that it is fairly accurate and that Penny Marshall, who, who made the movie, directed, produced the movie, um, really did her homework, and she had a lot of the former ball players on set and worked with her, and that um, none of the people in the movie could even read for a part unless they could play ball, at wow. least to a degree. Not that they had to be really good ball players, but they they had to be able to play ball a little bit. So so a lot of that, uh, a lot of the kudos goes to Penny Marshall for that. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. So they had to be able to, you know, hold the bat on their shoulder, yeah. ha have some you know, comfortability I, with the glove exactly, and that kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. I mean, and, and again, I mean, some of them were actually really good ball players. Um, Megan Cavanaugh, who played Marla Hooch in the movie, mm -hmm. uh, the scene where she's hitting inside the gym or, with her father and yeah. the ball keeps going out the window, that was actually Megan hitting that ball. Oh, wow. She was a really good ball player. Uh, Rosie O'Donnell was a was a good ball player, um, and so you know it really it made it seem real. And and so you know whatever Penny Marshall did, she you know she got the point across. And I, I love the line in that particular scene where Marla's talking to her father, and he says. Honey, you need to go where things happen. Yeah. You know, nothing's happening here. Nothing's yeah. going to happen that's here. Right. You've got to go where that's things right. happen, which is and that's and, and that's actually really poignant because um, for and, and one of the reasons I wrote this book, it's it, it's what that league meant to those women is so much more than oh I get to go play baseball. That's a big part of it, but it's also about going where things happen. I mean, you know, one of the things the movie showed was, you know, they, they, these girls were recruited from small towns, from farms, from, uh, you know, wherever, and, and, and that was true. And for many of them, they had never been outside their tiny little towns. And, and, and one of the uh, things that uh, I really focus on in the book is this idea of exposure to new cultures and to new societies and to new things. And, and so, you know, that, I'm glad you brought up that, that line because it, it is an important part of the legacy of that league. And uh, again, one of the many reasons I wrote the book because I think you can tell the history of that league over and over and over again and it's fun and it's exciting and 600 women got to play professional baseball which is really cool um, but the impact of that was lifelong for them and, and spanned uh, a lot of generations because they made sure that a lot of young girls and women after them knew about it and, and used 
their experiences to help create current opportunities for girls and women. So um, it was uh, it was it was a pretty significant time. Yeah, and I love how you you take us to the backstory of how all this got started. And I was impressed with how many famous baseball names we see tied into yeah. the story of the AAG yeah. PBL. It starts in 1943. You write about Philip Wrigley, right. uh, goes to, uh, who owned the Chicago Cubs right. at the time, goes to his general manager, Ken Sells, and says, we've got to find some way of maintaining attendance levels at both kind of uh, minor league parks and right. major league parks. That's and this right. was while the men were, of course, off fighting mm-hmm. in World War II. Branch Rickey was also kind of involved in Absolutely. these discussions. So Absolutely. some of the who's who of baseball lore tied in here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one of the things I really like about uh, what you wrote about, too, in, in this is that once the league kind of got started, fans that were coming to the game were really impressed with the quality of the baseball yeah, that these right. women could play. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, you know, when it started, uh, first of all, they recruited a lot of softball players because at that time, women's softball was extremely popular. Well, softball in general was extremely popular in the Midwest. And, in fact, in 1939, softball grew more fans than all of minor league baseball. It was an extremely popular. It was extremely popular sport, and so when Philip Wrigley and some other owners decided to try to put some people in seats and sell some tickets and, and kind of help keep baseball moving during the war, they looked for those softball players, and so uh, they recruited a lot of uh, local Midwestern softball players. Um, so they were good athletes. They were, you know, they and many of them. The story is the same pretty much over and over again. They played baseball with their brothers. They played baseball with the boys. Um, but if they wanted to play beyond that, they had to play softball because there really weren't a lot of options for them. Um, so he brought, they brought in a lot of really good athletes. And, and, and so they were able to train those softball players to, to play baseball. So to start with, they were good at, athletes. Um, now, when they first put some of the women on the field, there was there were folks who were skeptical. You know, the, some of the scenes in the movie. You know, girls can't play ball, and of course, you know, the ball player hauls off and knocks him off the <laughs> dugout. Uh, and which, by the way, I don't know that that happened, but I could see it happening. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> it definitely absolutely. could have happened. Um, but they, um, I, I think, people were a little skeptical, and then they thought, oh. Well, this is interesting. And then it became, oh, wow, these women can play ball. Um, and so it took a little time. You know, the league lasted from 43 to 54. So, so there was a lot of time for, for that uh, interest to build. And um, they were good ball players. They were good ball players after the league ended. Many of them went on to play professional softball and, and all kinds of other sports. But, um, yeah, they were, uh, they were very good baseball players. And uh, because the teams were local, for example, Rockford, Illinois had a team, obviously, the Rockford Peaches, Racine, and South Bend. They were all very local, so it was a community thing, which really put people in the seats. And the women lived in, in homes in the, uh, host, with host families in the area, so they became part of the community, and that helped too. So it was, uh, it, it was uh, I obviously wasn't there, wasn't alive to see it, but uh, from what I understand, it was they were very well received, both as individuals and representatives of their community, but also as ball players, and that was the key for them. Absolutely, and one of the things I really like about your book too is we learned that all of these girls had nicknames for each other. Oh yeah. Uh, a couple that really stood out to me in the book, there was Isabel Lefty Alvarez. Yep. There was Earlene Beans Rensinger. Right. But then as I was reading, I understand that you got a nickname. I did indeed. And they called you Kit Kat. Kit Kat. Which is a great story. Tell that, us about how you got the nickname Kit Kat. Well, that comes from Beans. Uh, <laughs> by the way, Beans is uh, pictured in my book. She was one of the first of the former ball players that I ever met in, in uh, 2003. Uh, Beans was very tall, lanky. Um, and so for the longest time, I thought, well, she had the nickname Beans, you know, String Bean or whatever. But no, it was because she liked beans. Uh, <laughs> but that's what people called her. She just always went by beans. So when I first, my first um, trip to their Syracuse reunion in, in 2003, it was the 60th anniversary of the league, um, I didn't know anybody. I was 
terrified. I was so enamored of, of these women, and yet um, just, it was frightening to walk in there, not know anyone, not know how they were going to respond to me, where they, would they be, you know, sort of, oh, geez, one more person asking questions, or, well, it was pretty quickly uh, okay with being there because they almost, every one of them opened their arms to me instantly. And Isabel Lefty Alvarez, who is, by the way, the subject of my second book, which will be out in a couple of years, um, she's from Cuba, uh, speaks with, with sort of broken English, and she approached me in, uh, uh, in the lobby of the hotel. I didn't know anybody. And she walked up to me and she said, have you seen Jane? And I said, I don't know Jane. And, and she said, oh, holy cow, there she is. And she pointed across the way at this woman that I also didn't know. And she said, here, carry this. So Lefty handed me her suitcase, and I went off following her as she went over to find Jane. And we walked up to Jane, and, and uh, Jane looked at Lefty, and without even really looking at me, said, who is this? And Lefty said, I don't know. And she said, well, why is she carrying your suitcase? And she said, well, I don't know. She had a nice face. And I thought, I thought she looked nice. And so I asked her to carry my suitcase. So this whole thing, this whole conversation went on with me standing there looking at them like, what is going on? Is there a candid camera somewhere? You know? And so, um, well, she has a nice face. And, and well, what's your name? My name is Kat. And so from behind me, I hear, oh, I don't know, Jane. She does have a nice face. And I turn around to look at, you know, about chest of beans, and she said, what's your name? Cat, ah, oh, Kit Cat. And I was Kit Cat until Beans passed away a few years ago, and still many of the women refer to me as Kit Cat. Um, uh, unfortunately, Jane has also passed away. Lefty is still around, and uh, they are, uh, they continue to be some of the most important people in my life. That's great. But uh, that was the way they accepted me. Yep. And I realized that now, in the moment, I was still terrified. <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea what was going on. And by the way, the end of that story is that Beans smacked me on the back, and she said, Jane, I think, I think she, she does seem nice. She has a nice face. In fact, she could carry your luggage, too. They all three walked off, and there I was carrying Jane and Lefty's <laughs> luggage across the, across the um, uh, hotel lobby. Oh, that's great. So uh, that would not be the last time I carried their luggage. I, but I, <laughs> I figured so. I figured that, that, because that becomes a tradition like Kit Kat <laughs> That becomes also, a tradition. But, that's right. That was, that was one of my favorite stories yep. in the whole book, but yep. how you got that name Kit Kat. Yep. Um, we'll, we'll put the cover of the book up here on the screen, but I wanted okay. to ask you about the woman featured in the picture and the yeah. cover picture on the front cover. Who, yeah. who is that and, and what is she doing there? Well, that is Maybelle Blair. Um, also, lovingly speaking of nicknames, referred to as All the Way May. Uh, it, Maybelle Blair is 92. She is the one of the founders of the International Women's Baseball Center, of which I am president. Uh, she is a former All-American. She played for the Peoria Red Wings, and uh, she is also uh, one of my dearest friends. And in that picture, she is, that, that picture was taken in 2015 in Orlando, Florida. Uh, we were at the first ever all-girls baseball for all national tournament, the largest tournament for all girls in the country. That tournament continues uh, today, and in fact, the International Women's Baseball Center hosts that tournament at our home in Rockford, Illinois. But that picture was taken um, while she was sitting at a picnic table with a very, very long line of young girls waiting to come and talk to her. And that is a testament to that movie. Mm -hmm. And by the way, those girls, some of them 10 years old, knew that movie. Yeah. Um, and also to the importance of those women in the lives of those girls. So, um, but the picture is fantastic because it really does a good job of of showing the personality of Maybelle Blair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was, yeah, it was a great it was a great photo. And, yep. and it just makes you want to learn more about who she is yep. and kind of what she did. Yep. I want to ask you about a, a quote that I that was in your book mm -hmm. uh, by Dorothy Seymour Mills and Harold Seymour, uh -huh. and it says. And I think this speaks so much to kind of what you've been talking about with, with, with these women and the impact that they had both then and now in terms of being mm -hmm. uh, baseball players. Um, they write, a woman may take part in the grandstand with applause for the brilliant play, with a waving handkerchief to the hero, but neither our wives, our sisters, or our daughters, nor our sweethearts may play baseball on the field. Baseball is too strenuous for womankind. 
And that came from Dorothy Seymour Mills and Harold Seymour. Can you give us some context about that quote? Well, I can. And first of all, I want to I want to clear up something. Uh, uh, um, uh, Harold Seymour is is no longer with us, uh, but Dorothy is, and Dorothy is the the queen of of women's sports writing. And um, that quote is a little. Um, uh, it, it's, it's taken out of context a little bit, and that was my fault. This quote was um, uh, in their book, and that is where that footnote comes from. They did not actually say that, and Dorothy was reporting on that. And so I want to I will speak to the quote because it is an important quote, but I also want to make sure that anyone listening to this who knows Dorothy Seymour Mills head would likely explode if they <laughs> thought that Dorothy had said something like that. So um, having said that, the importance of that quote is um, that it's, that has been the case from the the very beginning of organized baseball, this idea that it's it's not for women, that women can uh, be fans, or uh, and and even that it's it, it's different for women because we don't expect them to have the same understanding of the game. Um, that that women can uh, enjoy certain aspects of the game, but can they really understand it? And uh, you know, this idea, especially coming from the 19th century, that if women participated in sports, it was somehow going to damage their reproductive organs. Mm -hmm. You know, so all of that, all of that message about what women should and could do uh, in connection to sports or physical activity, and specifically baseball, comes to play in that quote. Now, I will say this, and one of the reasons that I use that quote is to, um, is to simply say, yeah, that's not the case, right. um, and it's never been the case. Women have been a part of baseball since the inception of baseball. They've always played, they've always coached, they've always umpired, they've always tended the fields, we keep the stats and build the stadiums. Women have always played the game. Women have always been part of the game. And the, the fact that um, uh, organized baseball, and in this case, Major League Baseball, um, is, is not opening its doors to women is both problematic and uh, frustrating mm -hmm. to those of us who understand the history. Um, so I, I, the quote is important because it represents a foundation of organized baseball and their ideas about gender. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is also important for people to understand that uh, some things have changed in terms of of what women and girls do in the game of baseball. Uh, for example, the highest ranking woman in Major League Baseball right now is a woman named Kim Ng. She's a vice president of Major League Baseball, and she is, as I understand it, being interviewed to be the first female general manager of the San Francisco Giants. That's which, right. and, and I know Kim, and she is fantastic, and someone who, if she makes it, she will turn around and help to bring that next woman up, and, and that's what we need. Um, so there are a lot of there are a lot of things, a lot of steps um, that we've taken, um, but uh, it's we've got a long way to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, in addition to your work on this book as a historian, you also recently, uh, well, in, in recent year or so, uh, got a visit from C-SPAN TV I did. for their American uh, uh, lectures in American That's history right. program. That's right. So tell us what that was. How, how did you get involved in that and what was that experience <clears throat> like having C-SPAN there filming one of your classes? Yeah, it was actually, you know, when I first got the email, I thought, yeah, right. I mean, you know, C-SPAN is contacting me and they want to film one of my lectures. And so I ignored it for a few days because I thought this isn't, this can't be right. So eventually I went back to it and I read it and I said, oh, okay, it seems a little legit. So I emailed them back and um, apparently one of my former students from maybe 10 years ago uh, worked at C-SPAN and they were having a, a big meeting about, okay, we need to plan these lectures. And this student who, and they did not tell me who the student was, <clears throat> the student said, if you're going to film a U.S. 
history lecture, you need to contact Cat Williams because she's the best lecturer I've ever had. Now, I'm assuming that student did well in my class. So, <laughs> um, so they did indeed contact me, and I said, sure, that would be great. So, it, you know, and I thought, eh, it's no big deal. I'm going to talk about my, do my lecture on World War II on the home front. I get to talk about baseball. I get to talk about women's history. And, and, and it went well, I think. Uh, it was a little weird having... Um, being in a different room that I was used to teaching in because they need a certain kind of room for the technology and everything. And of course, cameras. I mean, you know, it, I'm, I, there's no telling what's going to come out of my mouth half the time. And so I had to be a little careful because sometimes they're four letter words. So I, I wanted to be, I didn't want that on C-SPAN. But um, it was an exciting time. I think it was a, it was a, a huge um, boost to my ego. Um, what I do in the world of baseball and the, the writing and the other work I do with the International Women's Baseball Center is all very, very important to me. But I never lose sight of the fact that I can do those things because I have been and am a professor at Marshall University. And they have allowed me to grow in that way. Um, and they've allowed me to grow as a lecturer and as a professor. and. So that was one of the things that um, was kind of a nice little pat on the back. That's great. Well, yeah. Congratulations. What a yeah. great honor. Thank so you. You mentioned a moment ago that you're working on another book connected to uh, the All-American Girls Professional mm -hmm. Baseball League. So tell us a little bit about that book. And, okay. and it centers, I, you mentioned a moment ago, it centers around one of the ladies we were just talking about. That's right. In fact, the book is uh, about Isabel Lefty Alvarez, who is one of four Cuban ball players to come to the U.S. to play for the All-Americans. Um, Lefty came to um, to the U.S. at age 15. She spoke no English. Uh, she'd never owned a coat in her life. Uh, she, her mother put her on a plane with a small suitcase and a ball glove. And um, Lefty became uh, sort of a symbol for a lot of the, the women in the league uh, uh, and, and the ways in which um, having access to sport, having access to baseball, can really change your life in so many ways. Lefty became a U.S. citizen. Um, she played in the league until 1953 when she injured her leg. Uh, she stayed in the U.S., as I said, became a citizen. Um, but Lefty's story doesn't just start when she joined the league. Lefty lived an interesting life in Cuba. Her father was a, quote, policeman for Batista, and her brother fought with Castro. So you can imagine what that household was like. And uh, Lefty is, um, uh, was a very, has some very interesting stories and some very interesting stories about issues of gender in Cuba and, and the role of baseball in Cuba, which as we all know is, is huge. So, so this is a biography of sorts, but it's also, um, um, I use this concept I call sport identity. Um, to, to really talk about Lefty and the importance of sport to creating her identity. Uh, so it's uh, tentatively called uh, From the Streets of Havana, and it will be published by University of Nebraska Press. And right now they're looking at uh, spring of 2020. Great. Well, congratulations uh, on thank that. You. And I, I thank you. Thank you. I know it's going to be great. If it's anything I, is good, I, like I, this book, it's going to be fantastic. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, Kat, thank in our final moments with you today, if anyone wants to get in contact with you to talk to you about your book, yep. about your upcoming book, or sure. just about women's baseball or anything related yep. to the history that you uh, are an expert in, how can they get in contact with you, first of mm -hmm. all, and where can they get copies of your book? Well, they can get copies of the book on Amazon, um, or they can, of course, contact me. But the best email is probably catdwilliams1943 at gmail.com. Uh, and if you are unable to get the book on Amazon, I can certainly make sure someone gets gets the book. I'd love to hear from anyone. Uh, I love to hear stories about girls and women playing baseball and uh, the importance of sport in people's lives. Um, and and so the uh, uh, any time people want to reach out, I'd love to talk to them. That's great. Cat Williams has been our guest today, professor of American history at Marshall University. Her new book, The All-American Girls After the All-American Girl Professional Baseball League, or the AAGPBL, How Playing Pro Ball Shaped Their Lives. It's an outstanding book. Baseball is my favorite sport. It's the perfect game. And I would say if, <laughs> if anybody has seen uh, a league of their own, yeah. hasn't seen a league of their own, or wants to know more about this interesting history 
uh, in this interesting moment in American history with women playing professional baseball, they need to check out your book. And thanks thank so much you. for coming on the program I appreciate to talk it. about thank it. Thank you. It's great being here. We also want to take a moment to say thanks to the staff and management of Empire Books and News and the Inner Geek for providing our on-site support and assistance today. We encourage you to come down to Empire Books and News and visit the all-new revamped store and check out some of the offerings that the Inner Geek has here as well for you. You can pick up a copy of Cat Williams' book, and we also remind you that many of the other author, editor, and publishers that have been featured on our program have their works for sale right here at Empire Books and News. So come on down to Pullman Square and get whatever reading need you have satisfied right here at Empire Books and News, and we appreciate their sponsorship and support each and every episode here on Chapters. And if you'd like to stay in contact with the program to give us some comments and feedback on the programs that you've seen, or if you have a question or a comment or a story suggestion or an interview suggestion about this program, we'd love to hear from you. We've made that possible for you to reach out to us through a variety of social media platforms. One of the easiest ways to get in touch with us is through our email address, and that's right here at the bottom of the screen. It's lp4 at zoominternet.net. We do ask that you please include your name and town in which you're writing from so that we can keep track of that correspondence. If you like to watch programming on YouTube, we have a chapters page through the Armstrong One Wire page on YouTube, and that address is right here at the bottom of the screen. All you need to do is click on the Chapters tab when you plug that into your search browser, and you can find all of our author, editor, and publisher interviews archived for you there as well. And if you're a Facebook user, we also have a page on Facebook, a Chapters page on Facebook, and that's right here at the bottom of the screen. What you'll see there is our more recent author, editor, and publisher interviews archived there, but you can interact with viewers of the program, share and repost those interviews on your social media pages through Facebook and other places as well. So if you like Facebook, if you like YouTube, or you like email, we've made it possible for you to stay in contact with the program. Program. We know many of you have left us comments and feedback and send us comments and feedback regularly. We appreciate all that comment, those comments and feedback and support that we do receive. And that will do it for us this time on Chapters, but please come again next time. And in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you and your community.